Hey everyone, welcome to the second season of Aptica Talks podcast with even more great experts and hot topics on the way. I'm pretty excited to kick off this season with Genrich Lukanchuk, General Manager at BDIS, Transparent Mobile DSP. And in this episode, Aptica talks about in-app traffic, fraud, pre- predictive algorithms and future of programmatic advertising. Hey Genrich, how are you today? Ready to smash up us with a bunch of insights? Yeah, thank you so much for the intro. Not too bad, not too bad, doing good. Uh, yes, as usual, as usual, ready to share the insight with the industry and the and the participants. Great. So to get started, it would be nice to hear more about you, your experience, your background and your role at BDIS. Sure, no worries. So um, in short, been over 10 years in the advertising industry. Um, being an ex-Googler, I was leading the acquisitions teams for a C region for a small medium business sector and also leading the omnichannel solutions uh, for various countries uh, for large customer sales. Uh, been certified uh, project management professional and uh, also been uh, right now uh, currently leading the European development uh, for uh, for BDs, together with uh, a great team member with Arthur, who is the head of sales for BDs, uh, as of this year. Yes, I guess I met your colleagues at uh, Mobile Simon in Tel Aviv, and Arthur gave a great talk during the panel session. So yeah, it was awesome. Um, so just to begin with, uh, let's t- briefly talk about in-app traffic and in-app advertising, as it's something you deal with on a daily basis as DSP. Yeah. So um, and. Uh, I saw some uh, stats by Statista that this market generates around, um, if I'm not mistaken, $314.5 uh, billion. And in-app uh, advertising share is growing. And even within Aptica, we see uh, more and more advertisers, both on iOS and Android platforms with a lot of creatives. So, But again, there are a lot of challenges. And how uh, you... How do you cope and how do you manage the in-app traffic, in-app advertising within BDs, considering all these privacy regulations and restrictions? So how do you set up the campaigns to uh, achieve the best results possible? Yeah. Well, first of all, let's kind of have a brief review of uh, in-app traffic and why it's an exceptional source of advertising for various reasons, right? So first of all, the mobile users are spending approximately 90% of their time on various applications and it's equivalent if you calculate to more than three hours a day right so uh, roughly three and a half if i'm not mistaken according to the iba data uh, that is the average amount of uh, time spent per user uh, just browsing through various applications and uh, thus the applications represent a significant portion of a user's time right in general and uh, uh, of their retention um, the in-app ads specifically and in-app traffic, they um, um, have a conversion rate that in general uh, is three times higher than for the traditional ads because of the high user retention and uh, uh, generally because of the high concentration of a focus for, uh, for, the, for the end user. Basically, when you compare yourself, let's say when you're browsing on a website for a specific information and you are sitting with a specific application, uh, let it be like a dating app or a banking app or, or, or a gaming application, uh, your attention is all focused on a screen, right? So you observe each and every corner of all the application. So that's why uh, the banners are uh, way more attention grabby than uh, I would say for for the kind of classic website and just you know for the uh, for the web browsing. Um, so that's kind of you know the uh, the most important thing. Um, the other uh, aspect of uh, the programmatic uh, mobile advertising uh, would be uh, when comp- in comparison to uh, the data that's being accumulated using cookies. You know that's quite uh, standard for the website and for the for the browsers. Uh, when using an application, ad publishers in general can collect way more targeting information about the users, including such things as demographic, for instance, like age, um, internet uh, internet provider, operating system, device types, location, and many 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 more. Right? Uh, again, depending on certain GDPR regulations and certain corporate regulations. But in general, the amount of data that's being gathered is way more, which allows definitely for uh, better precision targeting and better uh, 
um, creation of look-like models in comparison to the um, kind of a cookie fa- uh, focused uh, website campaigns. Um, so that's why, uh, in general, the programmatic advertising uh, is superior to the uh, kind of classic um, website brow- uh, website advertising, classic banners that you, that you can see. Um, and uh, additional thing here uh, that should be noted is in regards to ad blockers, right? So ad blockers is something that's more relevant, again, for the web traffic. Uh, and it's not such a big concern for the in-app advertisers because of the freemium business models, again, which allow them to serve ads to kind of more mobile users and uh, um, but can help them in general uh, uh, that can attract sorry the users without uh, paying any price initially. So that's why kind of all the three uh, combinations, the large uh, uh, the big pool of uh, of data points, uh, the uh, less uh, impact of different kind of blockers, and uh, the uh, attention, uh, the user focus within those applications are the three primary points why programmatic is kind of a more relevant, more important and more interesting in our opinion for advertisers, you know, than, than the kind of the, the classic all the ways of, um, of well, basically advertising. You are correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, again, so you mentioned that um, now we have now we have more data about the users for in-app applications, but again, so we see that uh, it's it's getting stricter and stricter and more rigid with all this regulation. So do you see this shift uh, for you personally? Is it more difficult now to set up the algorithms based on the available data or for now it's not something uh, to take into account? Yeah, I, w- I would say definitely the kind of the changes, especially in uh, terms of the um, app, uh, Apple development, uh, especially for the scan models and kind of the scan releases that they're doing, is something that um, is uh, impacting the industry and is placing additional concern for the industry uh, key players. So for those you know who are not that much of a familiar, the um, uh, the scan or kind of the SCAD network, the Apple's privacy uh, preserving attribution system was developed over the course of many, many, many years. And uh, with the regional rollout of the so-called scan 1.0, there were no post install events tracking and uh, no industry adoption because it cannot be used for optimization. With additional releases in 2020, 2021, and definitely 2022, it all transitioned to the ability for the stakeholders that can they, that they can get up to um, three different postbacks and conversion windows are now fixed. Uh, and also the privacy threshold became more flexible, right? So we saw the transition from kind of opening this uh, these data channels uh, from 2000, I would say 2019 to 2022, with uh, additional concerns that it can all be rolled back, you know, to to the previous uh, state of the of the ecosystem. Um, that is more or less similar to what Scan 1.0 was, right? Kind of just shutting out of the gates. However, the industry is not, you know, staying at the same spot, and it's also developing, and uh, the rest. Two main things that are being right now carried out uh, by BD specifically, right? The first one is the adoption of more complex uh, machine learning algorithms that even with the uh, inability to source all the required data that we have um, at the moment, uh, such as the things with the user behavior attributes, such with the, sorry, with the contact attributes, with additional uh, creatives attributes, etc., uh, can still be leveraged to find uh, the, the users with the higher chance or the higher likelihood of uh, making certain conversions or making certain um, say, certain action within the event. So that's number one, right? Um, the investment and the development of the machine le- machine learning algorithm. Because over the, I would say, uh, the last five years, um the majority unfortunately of the uh dsps on the market became quite reluctant to invest in this for one particular reasons the abundance of data made it possible that even uh kind of a lesser um i would say less uh, 
complex and less sophisticated models, uh, such as like kind of linear regressions, you know, with certain penalizers, etc., uh, that existed for you know for 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 ten, for tens and tens of years in other industries, uh, were just adopted in programmatic, but were never developed. So right now, uh, the uh, center stage um, is being entered by neural networks by uh, kind of. Um, by random forest and other more sophisticated algorithms that require more uh, server power and server investments, definitely, uh, but are able to produce way, way, way better results, right? So I think this kind of a shift that we are having at the moment will definitely make the industry change and transition at rapid sp- uh, at rapid pace, uh, purely for the necessity of the of the clients. And uh, uh, as kind of a larger demand from the industry itself, right? So how do we leverage the data point that we have? Um, and as I mentioned, one of those is just, you know, upgrading the models that's, uh, that an industry is using at the moment. And the second, uh, the second thing here, I would say, is finding additional data points that might have been neglected in the, in, in the previous um, and maybe potentially um, building their own uh, kind of walled gardens uh, for each and every data that is being stored on the user by each and every DSP, by each and every SSP. So there is a possibility that we might move to kind of, you know, the existence of uh, um, a plethora of walled gardens in the industry where each DSP, where each SSP, we are each ad network would have their own um, database on, on the users that they've generated over the course of many, many years. Um, and the only kind of access for um, for a client would be to collaborate with uh, with a variety of, uh, of those uh, players on the market uh, simply because they would not be able to access all this inventory relying on one or two partners. Okay, so again, this is another possibility that we're also in BDs are exploring. Uh, but at the moment, I would say the more focus is coming on definitely the first one because it's uh, way more uh, complex, way more time consuming and requires definitely more um, capital expenditures in the infrastructure in comparison, you know, to, to kind of to the second approach. Mm-hmm. So we will notice then the diversification of the partners. So the clients will choose it, more it than is one possible. to... It is possible, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, apart from the privacy uh, challenge, we also have the fraud challenge. So because yes. wherever the money is, uh, frauds will likely to appear with... Uh, so we have so many, so much money running through different channels for in-app advertising. And of course, some... Uh, other players would like to steal, to borrow this chunk, this uh, slice of the pie. So, and uh, uh, I know that a lot of MMPs and DSPs, they're trying to cope with this challenge to mitigate the risks for their clients. So uh, specifically, how do you work with that within BD? So how do you mitigate the risks? Uh, what uh, solutions um, are you using currently? So, and uh, what signs do you see of this fraud and um, also i am particularly interested in the channel so what is the most active the most popular channel of the fraud activity now either i don't know click injection or sdk uh, spamming or boats or uh, device farms yeah i think that's you know a very good topic uh, on which i can spend you know hours and hours of potential you know discussing it uh, because it's such a, um, I would say, sometimes a mesmerizing things um, for 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 our clients, kind of to understand, to comprehend the reality, uh, the unfortunate reality of uh, the current state in terms of the fraud for the industry. Just to give you know certain uh, numbers, approximately one of every third dollar, uh, so thirty three percent on average, right, is being lost to this kind of activity, meaning meaning to the fraud activity. So. For a certain client that are thinking thinking that the fraud maybe you know represent ten percent, maybe five percent, because we had lots of them who are thinking that it represents a very kind of minuscule, small percentage of for the overall traffic. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, it represents a very huge chunk of it, right? Uh, on average, it's like thirty three percent. It's huge according to the IBA statistics, and um, I would say that's kind of the main. Um, 
location, the main countries that are being impacted the most are, first of all, the ones that have the highest levels of mobile penetration and mobile usage, meaning US, meaning China, meaning Japan, meaning UK. So basically, uh, all the tier one markets, right? Because they represent of all like 60 or more of the ad spend due to fraudulent activities, according to various report, uh, reports, uh, for instance, the Juniper research, where they kind of announced uh, and showcased the, the numbers. Um, and when kind of was speaking about, again, the volumes for, for the fraud, even though the, inter- the industry, uh, including us and including other very uh, good um, and respectful DSPs and SSPs in this field are doing everything they can uh, to combat this, uh, this malaise, right? The, the trend, unfortunately, is on the rise too. So year over year, uh, loss spend uh, is increasing, I would say, by roughly third, 35% on average. So for the comparison, in 2021, industry in total, right, lost uh, 50 billion in fraudulent advertising, right? In comparison to 95 billion, they lost in 2022. So you can imagine how uh, rampant and how uh, quick the development of the fraud activities is. So it's not something that um, is, you know, on a slow pace or there is a specific set of players uh, that uh, are not growing much of their capabilities. On the contrary, it's, you know, it's always the, the race with the kind of the fraudulent providers uh, because they find new ways of uh, supplying this kind of uh, inventory, if we, we if we even can call it an inventory, uh, to um, to the clients who are uh, not aware of it, and it's also the battle with the um, with the MMPs because again the MMPs are doing everything they also can to ensure uh, that the fraudulent uh, activities are not passing through and are um, kind of be, uh, being completely shut down. So I would say that that even for the MMPs. Um, even though they develop new um, rules and uh, new systems in place to detect fraud on a way better level, on a, ba- a way better scale, it's not the game of uh, one person, of you know, of, or one fraudland farm or whatever. It's always a constant, you know, the um, the the race chase, right? So something will come up, uh, some new. Uh, systems will appear on the market provided by you know by by, by the fraudulent uh, use providers, and uh, it'll take some time for MMPs to adapt. Okay, so it's not staying on the same place. So that's why you know it'll it'll stay with the industry unfortunately for a, for quite a long time, if not for forever. Uh, and just you know to give kind of the last um, data point for you know for our listeners and for viewers, I would say that according to multiple experts like the industry experts, the fraudulent installs per se account for 31% for iOS and 25% for Android app installs. So you can see again, those numbers are huge. We're not speaking about like small minuscule percentages. We're speaking of something that is unfortunately, uh, as, of, uh, as of the current moment, is the part of uh, kind of the overall industry health. Right, and uh, that's why so many DSPs, including us, specifically, uh, putting a lot of efforts and working with uh, lots of knowledgeable buying teams to understand where the inventory is coming from, um, looking at it uh, or across all angles, working with multiple MMPs to ensure that what we provide for our clients is of very high quality. Uh, so you mentioned the figures about the installs. Uh, so thirty-one yeah. percent for Android and uh, twenty something for iOS. Twenty-five, no, thirty-one yes. for iOS and twenty-five for Android. Right. So it's yes. we it's weird. Maybe I don't get it right, but I thought that uh, iOS uh, platform is safer uh, for. I mean, in terms of fraudulent activities, because it's quite hard to enter the uh, App Store rather than Android, and uh, fraudulent activity is more widespread on um, Android. So the percentage should be higher there. So why? We- N- not yeah, not always. I I think we when we we're talking about kind of the fraudulent activities, it's more related to the mechanisms of attribution. That's number mm-hmm. one, right? So the how attribution is being settled. Um, and tracked. And the second one would be the actual 
um, installs, right? How they're carried out. And we all know the, of the existence of so-called artificial intelligent farms um, that came as the, um, I would say, the new development uh, on the on the fraud lines uh, on the fraudless sphere uh, to general um, fraudulent farms where there were like you know bunch of bunch bunch of users uh, with certain devices just uh, working in cooperation with you know fraudulent providers clicking on uh, certain appli- uh, certain application installing this application probably doing nothing there depending you know on the um, on the key event, if it's the key event of install, it's just you know just installing the application. If the key event is some kind of action, then uh, circumventing the system in a way to make the end user believe that this action actually triggered, right? Making the MMP believe that the action actually triggered, why in the reality it didn't. So that's why uh, lots of the um, fraudulent providers they focus so much on the CPA billing. So that's mm-hmm. actually one of the very good. Um, indicators when, uh, as a part of the due diligence, every UN manager should be conducting on his end. When he is speaking with the um, with uh, with the key players in the fields, like in, in general with all the players, not only the key players in the field, and he's asking about this billing approach the people have. Uh, if it's a CPA base, it would you know it should sound a huge alarm. So, you know the, the red flag should be everywhere for one particular reason because um, there is a very high chance. That uh, was this kind of a race button down the end. Provide me with you know with the cheapest traffic that delivers the best results, right? The um, uh, the network, let's put it, let's call it them the network. They can provide them with extremely cheap CPAs, for which the, the person can be built. The the UM manager will believe that he delivered the greatest results, right? Because everything triggered. The MMPs looks like you know they verified everything, but then the finance team on the on the client end will come in and say, hey, you know what? nothing came through you know there were no actual purchases there were no actual um activity from on, on the user's behalf we received no money and then the UN manager will be asking like how it's possible you know but mmps they confirmed all the activities probably you are wrong guys probably you know something and we've seen those cases unfortunately when the uh, ua teams were debating with the finance teams over the actuality of the money coming in where well, basically the finance team was saying you know there is no money flowing in a bank account so we don't care what you're showing on your uh, UA screens or, you know, in the MMPs tracking. What we see is no money inflow. And uh, basically, well, that's where the fraudulent networks, unfortunately, are taking certain advantage of for those kind of unsavvy, um, uh, with lesser experience um, U- UA teams, because, you know, they got so stuck into believing that uh, if everything was reflected you know, on the systems, you know, by the MMP providers, then everything is definitely correct without doing any kind of due diligence and understanding of uh, of the current activity. I'm not saying, you know, that each and every network that is doing uh, kind of the CPA billing uh, is involved in this kind of activity, but it usually correlates uh, on a uh, kind of on a higher scale uh, with this kind of thing, because for each and every optimization, if you go to kind of the main key DSP providers, including us, um, it would be a basic understanding that each and every model that would be searching for really high quality traffic must be trained, must be tested, uh, and it takes time, right? So it's not always possible to provide uh, great uh, CPA numbers with, let's say, small budgets if there was no prior training of the models, no prior investment in those uh, models on the very start. So... Sometimes, again, you can see that the industry is being plagued by this kind of a mentality that, hey, you know, those networks provide us with a very low quality or with, with, yeah, with a very low quality, a very low CPA cost traffic right from the very beginning. But down the road, let's say in a month, in two months, um, they, they realize that what we've been provided with is pure fraud. Uh, while the key players would be focusing on optimizing the actual high quality and traffic, but that would require certain, of course, fluctuations and volatility, especially during the first times of any any launch. So it's better to have a CPA, CPM billing method of rather course. than CPU? Yeah, okay. because it would be, uh, first of all, it's, um, uh, it's a standard for uh, mm-hmm. for a very large key players in the industry that they're working so you can you can talk and definitely ask uh, any 
uh, large DSP in the world and they will tell you they're working only on a CPM basis. There are no exceptions. Maybe there, there exist certain exceptions when there is a high inflow of data, right? Uh, when the ability to predict become, becomes so uh, such of a high level that even certain fluctuations within uh, um, CPAs are minimal. And that's when the potential transition to the CPA billing is possible. But again, the budgets that are required for such a transition are uh, of, let's say, of very uh, high numbers, right? So they're very high numbers and definitely not something the um, any, any DSP would start with initially. Mm-hmm. And uh, getting back uh, to the beginning of uh, my question uh, about the channel. So mm, I don't know whether you have detected maybe uh, the main channels for now of the fraudulent activities. So what is that? Uh, farms, boats, uh, SDKs, plumbing, clicks, all of them. So. Yeah. I would say that we collide in, every, uh, in general with all the various uh Kind of fraudulent techniques, including farming, including uh, SD, uh, SDK spoofing and uh, uh, click, in, uh, click injection. So like everything, you know, everything comes into play. It depends, first of all, on the vertical. And the second, it depends on the uh, on the country, on the geolocation. So we know, let's say, that for certain uh, countries, um, mostly in APAC, that would be kind of the farms that provide the, the uh, this kind of a traffic, uh, more advanced, like technological, uh, more complex um, fraudulent traffic is uh, is rampant for say for Western Europe and the US. Um, but again, uh, there are certain verticals where we see basic farms, you know, doing this. Um, so I wouldn't say that, you know, there is one or two uh, things we um, we face, you know, uh, when we kind of analyze the traffic, uh, the initial traffic and the initial traffic providers. Um, it's over. It's uh, very hard to pinpoint the specific things that are... Um, happening you know um in the in the industry from the f- fraudulent perspective it's always changing so that's what i can so, tell you for sure yeah you need to be aware of all the uh tricks uh that the uh, frauds and fraudulent activities are there yeah okay so and uh, concerning the verticals uh, are there any specific verticals that are more uh, affected maybe by the fraudulent activities gaming for example or yeah, I would I would say gaming uh, became um, significantly impacted by the fraudulent activities uh, from I would say twenty uh, twenty um, somewhere around that time when the you know when the COVID pandemic hit and there was a gaming boom. Of course, it attracted a large number of um, uh, malevolent players to to the fields that uh, during certain kind of periods of time uh, completely overwhelmed the industry. Right, so it took them some time to clean all the, uh, let's say, clean all the rubbish uh, from 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 the inventorial perspective. Uh, but yes, the gaming was impacted significantly. Now it's way better. So what we see, it's it's significantly improved for three reasons. The uh, UA teams became more educated, more savvy. Um, second, they established the connections with uh, the certain uh, traffic providers. Uh, programmatic uh, participants uh, that they've trusted, that they've seen over the long, uh, let's say, span of many, many months, of even even years, um, that been able to provide this high quality of traffic, and they're staying with them. So that's why you know, um, the the loyalty is usually very high in 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 this field. And uh, third, uh, the MMPs also helped uh, in terms of uh, developing new uh, systems to combat fraud. Right, but again, it's not something that uh, the the industry faced. Uh, the industry fixed, and they can you know forget about it because the the fix is so permanent. On the contrary, I would say, in the very beginning, when I was talking about kind of the development of the models for kind of machine learning, it would be folly not to admit that um, the same developments are also occurring on the uh, on the uh, fraudulent uh, network providers. Right. Um, so the same machine learning algorithm being implemented, they are hunting for, you know, great data scientists and great data engineers to circumvent um, what the um, the industry um, is uh, is doing at the moment uh, so they can 
uh, um, make another influx, you know, another flood of, of the fraud traffic and uh, display it as, as a good one. So, yeah, it's, yeah. as I said, a constant battle, uh, no way to, to pinpoint the specific measures all over the place. Mm -hmm. So they are doing their best to pollute the data. So and evolve uh, their mechanisms. Yes, um, I also read uh, about programmatic advertising, and there is this statement uh, that advertisers feel safer uh, with uh, programmatic advertising due to advertising due to the transparency. But yes. in the re in the reality, there is no this difference as with both uh, with programmatic advertising uh, with traditional advertising. You can lose your budget. Uh, and uh, you can uh, receive this uh, um, fraudulent traffic so on the same level so is it myth or is it a reality yeah i mean that's a very good question so that's why we always uh, in abilities we always start with the kind of the tests um uh, the initial tests with our clients first of all to ensure that the models that we're trying to build are of a high quality right so that's why it's always an investment you know on on the client's end And uh, the second that we're able to, on the very early stages, uh, to detect this kind of a fraudulent traffic that if we're being, you know, provided, can be cut immediately, right? Um, and that's why sometimes we, when the clients are um, saying that they're able to, kind of, to scale significantly on the second day, on the third day, uh, we still kind of make a warning to ensure that we don't um, put them at risk you know, of ruining completely their, their spending because, you know, that's the, uh, their money, their budgets, and we want to provide the best results for them. So in this case, it's always about the first initial investments uh, on the client's end uh, to both ensure the bespoke models can be built for the client, for his specific needs, and the second, that the traffic that's being sourced uh, can be analyzed in the early stages and only the good one can be provided in the end. Mm -hmm. So your analysis is performed via AI tools, uh, AI algorithms and uh, based on machine learning. Uh, but uh, do you use a manual analysis? Do you check your algorithms? Yeah, I would say uh, it comes mainly in th uh, two main stages. Um, and without you know going too much into technicalities, I would say there is a, a pre um kind of pre-install, um, pre-event uh, um, fraudulent detection activities and post-install, post-event uh, fraudulent detection activities. So uh, so usually they're split in like um, 30-70 or 40-60, um, that meaning that after initial event occurred, again, we analyze the data to ensure that, yes, it actually took place and there are no behavioral patterns that would indicate that, hey, it, it, it's not suspicious, you know, everything looks good, everything looks clean, because uh, very high-end uh, fraudulent networks, what they do is they're able to emulate, emulate the behavior of the user to such an extent that it's, uh, it became completely undistinguishable from, from the real one. So uh, I'll give you an example. Even with you know opening the first uh, kind of the first deposits, right? The uh, the person is able to kind of set up the account, make all the clicks, uh, go to the web page, etc. Wait for a certain time um, for for the deposit because you know the you know you could kind of get all your details and banking details, you know, to 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 make it. Um, and if the person, if the system is kind of looking at the CPI or certain actions that are not the actual deposits right um or that would take certain time uh let's say four days five days to open the deposit within this time frame the network can show that hey listen we've made so much progress within those five days right without the actual opening the deposit that it looked like we brought you very very high and relevant users and if the model uh on the client side is built kind of a, to predict based on this behavior that's very very similar to the behavior of the actual users, the client will, will, you know, will buy in. And he'll say, you know, you provided us such a great quality traffic within those five days. It looks like they will, inst you know, install almost the next day, almost in a couple of days. Let's, you know, let's speed up. Let's uh, get more investments. One, two week additional passes, no results. You're being questioned and, you know, the, the fraudulent provider is gone. And uh, he just sends you send the bill for the CPA saying, hey, you know what? We provided you with this kind of all the, um, um, 
actions that we agreed upon in the contractual terms, but you know, now it's your time to pay. And in reality, they realized it was just pure fraud. So that's why uh, it's very important also to analyze the post uh, event activities, post click activities, uh, what's actually happening there. Um, it can be detected again on various stages, uh, can be detected on the on the click stage. Uh, again, on how the, uh, let's say, the um, the click to install window, for instance, the timing, if it's done too rapid, uh, too quick, and it's usually a question of uh, if it's uh, driven by some algorithm with some machine, or it's done a be user behavior, because usually it takes, let's say, five minutes, four minutes, sometimes less, sometimes more for a user to, to, to install. But if it's done in like in a couple of seconds after a click, you know, I mean, have you, uh, what's the last time have you installed an application immediately, you know, after clicking on the ad? So there are certain minuscule details that are being picked up by, uh, by us, uh, by MMPs. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that, that's how we're trying to detect if the fraud occurred or not. Uh, so you get the results from your algorithms and then there is a person behind it also analyzing uh, this data, just uh, checking whether the, um, I don't know, conclusions are right or wrong. Yeah, so basically what's, um, it, it comes to working with, first of all, with trusted network, trusted data providers uh, and trusted SSPs and ad, ad, ad networks, right, who were claimed over the many, many years to provide only clean traffic. But again, it doesn't mean, as any, with any due diligence, that uh, if you've uh, conducted this kind of preliminary research, it would be a guarantee. It's never, unfortunately, a guarantee. And SSPs are in no way possible can monitor each and every you know, um, data point that's being provided and analyze it manually uh, for, you know, for specific deviations. In it's just not possible. So that's why it will be always, uh, you know, kind of pathing through or skipping through the networks. It will always occur. It's just the uh, frequency. So first of all, you know, we work with the uh, the best um, SSP the, on the market that providing the highest quality data. Second, we have again the systems uh, on our end that are able to detect the fraud. As I said, the post event, pre event, pre click, post click. Okay, uh, and the third, of course, is the MMPs. It's their additional job to verify. So you, you can see that there's lots of small, small layers that are put together forming this kind of uh, the fraud detection puzzle, if you, if you may. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the whole, whole collaboration, not only of us, uh, but also of, of, different, uh, of different teams. And on top of that, what we in BDs do, we work closely with the buying team who know, who've been experts in the field for, for tens of years, uh, who understand uh, different patterns that may not be picked up uh, by, the, uh, by the algorithms yet, but uh, they see it and they can kind of flag it immediately for us, you know, for the sales team, for the data engineering team, say, you know, it looks very suspicious, guys, and it, it, it looks something is wrong going there. Can we investigate? So again, the human aspect is also very important because relying purely on the algorithms, and we've seen, you know, many, many, many times, uh, it's just uh, sometimes a suicide for a client because, the again, the algorithm can be circumvented, by the fraud player, and if there is no kind of human still scanning, still kind of analyzing the uh, the traffic that's being provided, uh, then yeah, it's uh, it's just the end game. Oof. Uh, so, so what to expect uh, in the future of programmatic advertising? Uh, so one thing that we know for sure, fraudulent activities will be there with us. So, but maybe some positive dynamic and positive trends to expect. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, definitely, apart from, you know, uh, apart from the fraud, there are many, many good things happening in the programmatic field. Uh, and I would just kind of name three ones. The first uh, is, again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the transition of the whole industry to the actual um, uh, deep learning algorithms. Um, so they would be implemented by by the very, very variety of the um dsp providers the uh, the the ad networks in comparison to what we have at the moment all right so we in bds we are implementing those uh, more sophisticated algorithms for our clients that will help them to um create those look like models in a quicker um in in a shorter time setting um and uh, would be of a high quality but this is 
well, it's an investment, right? So it's definitely a significant several investment. It's significant um, human resource investment because you, know, you need you need the, the data engineering team who is uh, very sophisticated in the recent developments in, let's say, neural networks, in how, let's say, the different layers are being constructed, what's the best composition right now uh, for this, you know, for, for addition to the, the lay construction, let's put it this way, what the uh, different uh, things in, in, in the random forests are, what are the recent development there, because, you know, it's such a huge block uh, from a mathematical standpoint uh, that's it requires uh, as I said, significant investment from the human capital there. We can't rely on the models, like linear models, linear regression that being, you know, uh, taught on the kind of the basic levels in during bachelor's or master's uh, to stay with us forever. So that's why this transition from this side is happening. And uh, we're happy to know that we and BDs are on this path and um, will be able to provide soon with the best possible uh, algorithms for our clients. Uh, but yeah, that, I think that's one of the developments um, that will occur in the uh, industry eventually. The players will not be able to adopt it. I mean, you'll see the results after potential um, kind of wall gardening of of the of the uh, key players, like say the Apple and potentially Android, uh, will significantly suffer and potentially go out of business. So that's number one. The second is, and again, it's more of a hype in my opinion, than the reality, but, you know, I need to kind of still pick it up. Um, it's the creatives and creative AI, uh, because one of the things that's, um, in our opinion, um, can be uh, changed and can be visible to the end user who interacts with the uh, with advertisement, right, with the placement, uh, is basically the creative right uh, either it be the sk overlay or either it be a simple banner or a video ad a native whatever uh, it's always the the creative aspect right and uh, there is a huge huge um, kind of trend a huge wave from the market saying that you know with all the creative ai we can we can create so many brand new creatives in comparison to what we have at the moment and if you know at the moment it's it's kind of the very basic tools that are being implemented by the both very large players like google and uh, others for instance just pure uh, let's say background color changes or uh, certain let's say resolution changes to fit in in the right uh, for for mobile for various mobile um uh, hardwares um, devices. So I would say um, th there is kind of this um, understanding that with the with the creative CI, it's going to significantly improve. However, however, it should be noted that um, uh, it all sounds great, you know, on paper, but in reality, the end question is who is going to prove it. So the end, uh, do we believe that uh, the clients? would be completely you know, complacent and uh, agreeable uh, to add tens of thousands, or let's say tens of, or hundreds and hundreds of newly created creatives uh, without them pro kind of reviewing them, accepting them and approving them, right? So I, I don't think it is, right? Especially for a large key player that have their own PR teams, that their own uh, compliance team in place, uh, across all the industries. So it's not only, let's say, something that is relevant for banking. I would say on contrary, it's more relevant even for the gaming industry, where they have a certain um, kind of understanding, especially with a very large uh, players or how they want to position themselves uh, through the creatives, right? Because it, it becomes kind of a part of their um, extension of their brand and they don't want to get it hurt. Uh, and if they see random creatives being appeared, uh, generated by AI and controlled, Probably. I mean, it, it, it doesn't look good. So I don't believe the trend will pick up unless there would be some automations or some kind of a new systems um, for the approval process that would, you know, generate something in, you know, in, in decent boundaries. But, you know, it's still I still don't believe it. There is so much of the um, human um, kind of approval of the human interaction that uh, that's, you know, involved there. And cannot be automated. So yeah, that's more of, a, in my opinion, more of a hype than a real trend. And the third one, uh, final, is uh, the uh, market uh, price prediction for auctions, 
right? So that's something that been uh, in the uh, finance industry for you know for quite a long time that the guy's been using for quite a long time, but it's now being transitioned and been now picked up by the uh, advertising. Uh, community and spe- specifically within programmatic. Uh, basically, for those you know who are not aware, uh, it would be answering the simple question: What uh, the auction price of the bid should we go with prior to actually bidding? So, what's the minimal price we can win with? And it's uh, always you know a, a, a good idea to to uh understand for for uh, especially for large dsp providers uh because it would significantly reduce the um the buying costs of a traffic right uh so imagine that instead of let's say uh placing the highest bid possible right and paying for the second uh second bidded price with a certain premium you would be able to uh narrow down the range so much that uh you would not be, you'd not be either paying those kind of huge premiums at all, or you'll not be participating in um, auctions that would not be uh, of a high quality um, for, for the end user, right? Meaning to attract the new user for you. So this is, you know, something uh, that's being developed by the industry. It's something on our roadmap uh, for sure. Um, so I'd say that is kind of a more important uh, at the moment. Uh, for, for for the industry in general and for us too. Okay, so thank you for sharing these insights uh, with us today and thank you for your time. Uh, please follow BDs and the, their blog section. There are a lot of uh, other insights to look through and the marketers talk, uh, that's the great project. So uh, I'm sure you will find some useful information there apart from this podcast. So thank you, Genry, for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time.